Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Rogers, children's librarian, a podcaster for kids, and a member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. And I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please submit your questions via the chat at the bottom of your screen if you're attending on a desktop computer or at the top of your screen if you're attending from a mobile device. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Patricia Jimenez will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may use dial-in with the phone number and access code provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask you to complete a four question evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use this data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. Land statement. The Arizona Library Association wishes to acknowledge the native nations that have inhabited Arizona lands for centuries. We honor the people of these nations on whose ancestral homelands and resources AZLA members, member libraries were built. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Arizona Library Association members accountable to the information needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across the state. Visit azla.org for more information. Please support AZLA when you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through the Amazon Smile portal, Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases made to the Arizona Library Association. The Professional Development Committee wants you. If you have expertise in library science that you think would be helpful to other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You'll find a link to the form in your professional development monthly newsletter. I want to invite you to attend the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On September 9th, join us for Listening Connects, podcasts for kids. Join me <laughs> and Ann Bensfield as we share information about the growth in KidCast content, recent survey results about how kids and families listen together, new tools for discovering podcast shows, and ideas for how you can connect and engage kids and families with kids' podcasts. Registration for this webinar is posted to the Arizona State Library's events calendar the AZLA calendar, and advertised in the monthly professional development newsletter. A link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. And I would like to thank you all for attending today. I'll pass the presenter privileges to Jolene Bradley, Glenn Brown, Shelley Reddy, and Andrea Small for their presentation, Library Con Online, connecting community and pop culture on a virtual stage. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Uh, and thank you for that marvelous introduction. My name is Shelley. I'm a librarian at the Fountain Hills branch of the Maricopa County Library District. For the rest of uh, the team here today, would you guys introduce yourselves? Um, I'll go first. I'm Jolene Bradley, and I'm the program resource manager uh, here at Maricopa County Library District. I'm Andrea Small, and I'm a librarian with Asante Library with Maricopa County Library District. And I'm Glenn. I'm also a librarian at the Litchfield Park Library, again, part of the Maricopa County Library District. And I'll go ahead and share my screen. We were going to play you a video, but you guys know how that goes. Um, and I'll switch it to full screen mode. And can you see my screen OK? Great. Um, so we're super excited to have you all here with us today uh, to share our, our library con from 2020. And soon we're going to have a library con for 2021. Um, again, virtual, but uh, we're still super excited about the things that we learned from last year, which we're going to share with you today and the things that we're going to do uh, to even make it better for this year. Um, so as we've done, we just went through our, our introductions and you'll be hearing from each of us today. And as I said, I'm Jolene Bradley and I did the planning behind all of this. Um, the other three presenters that you're gonna hear today really are the masters of the art and the craft and all of the fun things that uh, came with LibraryCon. But you gotta put it together to make it all work. And that was just it. Um, with LibraryCon, what we did is uh, we're fortunate as a library district to have 18 different libraries throughout Maricopa County. We're really spread out. But the beauty of virtual is that we were all able to come together um, seamlessly, really, uh, throughout, um, really right after the pandemic started and we were all sent home, our programmers jumped right into it and they started creating virtual programming I would say a week within um, when we shut our libraries down. So we had all this amazing content um, that they had been creating for um, about a year. It wasn't quite when we did the, the library con, but what we did was that we pulled all of their videos that they had been putting on our, our regular website, MCLD Now, and we put them into the library con as well as a bunch of other new things. So our virtual library con is a collection of playlists and we'll talk about the different playlists and the different programs throughout our, our webinar today and um, coming together through a bunch of uh, throughout, like I said, like probably 80 programmers, maybe more 50 that were able to to um, submit their, their virtual events. So what I did was taking those videos and putting them into the playlist. So below here, you can see that our website had the highlights um, and I'll talk about how we changed those out. Our program lasted for two weeks in September. Um, we also had a playlist on crafting on bookshelves, so book uh, recommendations and things that we were able to, also videos and, and other pieces and presenters. And you'll hear from Andrea talking about how we were able to get different authors and people in for that. And I think I'll switch to the next slide. So with all of those um, um, different playlists, I was then able to embed them into one um, website and we worked with our webmaster for this. So the beauty of it is I don't have any training um, in being a webmaster or working with code or anything like that. It is just very simple in terms of taking the, the playlist that you create. We used Vimeo, but you can also use YouTube or another um, web or video provider. Um, and then creating those playlists and then using the embed link so that it can then be embedded in a web page. And you can see here on the side, 
when you clicked on the playlist, it then gave you 20 videos here. And if you were to click on any of these other ones, it would give you um, multiple videos. We had over a hundred um, videos and Shelly will give you the right number um, as she moves forward too. So the key though, is getting the embed code for the playlist itself. So what you'll do is you'll create that playlist um, and depending on what video provider you're working with, you can then find the playlist embed and um, take that embed code and put that into a web page and your, your um, playlist will be embedded so that people will be able to use it. And that's the only thing I had to give to our webmaster. From there, I could switch the videos out constantly. So I didn't need to keep going back to our webmaster or the person that had control of our website um, to be able to make these changes. It was very easy to to add things and move things um, as the week went on. So as I mentioned, we used um, the archived videos that we had from the, I don't know, like I said, not quite a whole year of doing virtual programming as a, as a district and all the new events that you're gonna hear Gwen and Andrea and Shelly talk about that they put together. And we also did highlights because one thing that we talked about as we were planning was that we were going to do a two week um, library con um, and we wanted people to keep coming back because the one we also just really realized that on demand uh, works really well for us and our customers because uh, it's easier for us to get the videos um, created and to edit them and then put them into um, the playlist for people to grab and we thought that way people can jump in anytime um, to use those. So what's going to keep coming, bringing them back? And the reason that we did that was then we then created the themes. So for about three to four days, people could come in and we, switched, we added the themes to uh, comics, the gaming um, for anime and manga and pop culture. And then we did the finale with the best of library con. So um, that was pretty great to be able to make sure we tried to hit uh, some of those major points that you see uh, in, in library comms. Um, the other thing that we did was we wanted some interaction with our customers, because that's one hard thing. As you know, when you're doing virtual, you can't uh, get people's reactions and you want them to take part some way. And what we did last year was we asked them to submit um, a photo of themselves in their, their cosplay um, or their, um, here, I'll, I'll move forward, or like their collections of, of what they love the most in terms of con. So um, we got probably over a hundred photos and it was pretty great. We created a, um, a slideshow that you could then go through and see everybody in their awesome costumes and the amazing work that they did. And we thought that was going to be a nice way for people to be able to share their work um, since they weren't able to be in person for so many cons um, throughout the, the quarantine time. Um, and we used Flickr then to create the gallery and people could then go in uh, throughout the con to see photos that had been added. And, um, and then, like I said, we created a video so that at the best of con, we could then share them. Uh, so just a taste, I had to throw this in there. I was reliving what some of the videos were like. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, it's true. Like the 30 plus performer or programmers that we had throughout the district. And um, the last thing I want to mention too is don't be afraid if you don't have a huge library district that you're working with, find people that you know throughout the state and put your videos together, share them. Um, this is the great thing about a virtual pr uh, platform is that you're able to work together from wherever you're at and um, bring some really great resources to the people that we work with. So that's what we did for planning. And I'm gonna hand it over to Shelly to talk about the content um, of, and I must say, I went back and I looked through my emails and Shelly, this is her baby. She thought about it. This was her idea. And she's like, hey, why don't we bring um, 
a Comic Con to life in Library Con, even though we can't meet in person, let's do it virtually. So it was an email back in July 2020, and we were able to pull everything together. So hats off to Shelly. So I'm sending it over to you. Which jumping in as a district, going from uh, July with the inspiration of it and thinking about this and going, hey, why don't we try and do this? And we actually launched it in September. So it was a compressed timeline. I'm not certain that we would want to do it again on that type of timeline. But fortunately, since we had been building the content for several months, it really worked out great. And our library con originated with its inspiration at the confluence of several different opportunities. Wonder Woman was the mascot for ALA's library card sign up month campaign. Of course, with the pandemic, Phoenix Fan Fusion and so many other wonderful events had been canceled. And the community was just really missing the opportunity to celebrate and expand their interests and skills. And having being a member of a couple of different online forums, I could see how much people were missing that. So I reached out to Jolene and the district and Jolene and all of the other staff at the other branches were just fantastic about diving in and saying, yes, we love this. We want to see it too. So additionally, of course, as Jolene mentioned, we had been doing the virtual programming for several months. And so we did have that roster of programs, which uh, from a programming standpoint, you put a lot of time into something, you create something that you're proud of, and then it was on for a couple of days or a week or so, and then it disappeared initially. So we were like, hey, how can we get some more use out of these programs? Now, because of their size, uh, these con type events are really a great platform for exciting interest in a topic. A person can look at a single event on a calendar and not find it relevant, but a larger event with multiple programs holds an innate promise of something for everybody. If we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. The main challenge in having these large scale in-person events comes from staffing both the branch and uh, where the event is occurring and the event itself. But hosting the event virtually meant that we could not only reuse those past programs and draw on staffing from all of our different branches, which really reduced the overall workload. And these same strengths can be applied to any subject. In the past, our libraries have done large scale programs on genealogy, history, literature, science and technology, as well as pop culture and Comic-Con types of uh, activities. And many of these large events that were held in person have the potential uh, to be virtual applications. Uh, now, makerspaces and technology are really popular and important right now with the increased interest in STEM. And a virtual expo means being able to use video editing to showcase those more in-depth and time-consuming projects. In fact, in March of 2020, my branch participated in a virtual festival where we celebrated the dark sky movement in Arizona, which not only let us connect with the community at a very difficult time to do in-person events, but it let us showcase our astronomy resources and telescope lending program. In November of 2020, I have to give a shout out to Glendale Public Library, which held a Regency and Jane Austen themed virtual con called Pride and Prejudice and Zoom. And it brought in international presenters and attendees to explore these beloved stories and costuming, period culture and more. Now, uh, previously, ALA has done a feature on an in-person program by the Yuma County Library District's Pamela Gutierrez, uh, where she connected families with resources and services before the start of the school year. With a few modifications, something like this could be held virtually as well. And uh, currently going on at our El Mirage location, the branch manager has been operating a hybrid service for job seekers, which pairs virtual classes with weekly listings of available jobs in the community that they can then pick up either in the branch or through our curbside pickup. Next slide, please. Now, like libraries, Comic-Cons generally have a very open and welcoming atmosphere in which individuals with all levels and of skill and interests in a variety of topics have the opportunity to, to interact and advance their knowledge. Like with library programming, the best events are allowed to bloom from a really strong foundation. 
So when you take a look at how to provide the best opportunities for fun, bring added value to your events and programs, and keep them easy to connect with. A big consideration for this is technology. What tools do your staff have? What are they comfortable using? How can they utilize it in a new way? And how about the majority of your customers? If you can find that sweet spot where everything interconnects, you have the opportunity for magic to happen. Next slide, please. Now, as Jolene mentioned, we have over 100 different programs and virtual live events in our library con, which included ultimately over 5,800 views. About one third of these were focused on books and library resources, everything from readers advisory programs, genre explorations, writing classes, author talks, and more. And these all received 1,500 views, which were fantastic uh, from an emotional boost standpoint because we are all so passionate about what our libraries offer. And our other area very close to our heart, which had a very strong showing at LibraryCon, was story time and youth programming. This comprised over 40% of our plays. They had 20 different videos, including everything from Harry Potter themed uh, classes to rock and roll and superhero story times. And this had over 1900 views for just 20 programs. So it really shows you the potential that's out there for these virtual uh, platforms. Now, you can't have a library con or any sort of uh, con type event without cosplay and costuming. And I have to admit, several of us at the, at the library system are secretly very into this, and some of us not so secretly into this. Uh, but we had over a thousand different plays for 18 programs, which ranged in included everything from making an aging faux metal to designing a pattern, sewing skills, uh, crafting a tail, uh, foam armor, all sorts of things. Let's see. And then we did have uh, great opportunities to just link in other subjects that were a little bit more tangentially connected, maybe things like uh, streaming video resources or archaeology. And so like a big Comic-Con event, it really gave our staff the opportunity to showcase their passion and their expertise. Uh, next slide, please. Now, whenever you're looking at trying to plan a program, whether it's in a library in person or for a large scale virtual event like this one, we generally go to the same different or the same criteria to start out with. What is timely? What big topics are out there? For the Comic-Con style event, what big movies and books are just being released? What tie-ins can we find? Uh, Today, we might look at questions of how have graphic novels dealt with topics like diversity and social justice over their history and in the last few decades. Of course, we like to look at what's popular and what's going to excite the imagination for our customers. What speaks to and is relevant to a really large group of people? If you start mentioning fandoms like DC, Marvel, Disney, Doctor Who, Game of Thrones, Harry Potter, Outlander, Star Wars, and Star Trek, you start to see those smiles pop and people get really excited. They have massive groups of followers with a lot of crossover in between them. So having programs that spoke to each of these different fandoms or could be explored across several fandoms were fun for both our staff and our customers. Uh, next, what important skills do you look at? Uh, our superhero story times unfortunately couldn't actually teach web slinging. However, having that lens or filter of the fun experience and energy uh, through which our audience received those tips and practice in foundational literacy brought a new audience to the program. And we did actually hear of several uh, septuagenarians that were secretly watching the virtual story times and they felt comfortable about it and loved it because they didn't feel guilty walking into a program full of toddlers. Uh, our costuming and cosplay videos were really popular. And if you wanna help your community with job hunting, having programs in resume writing and interviewing are essential. So whatever your topic is, just dive into those essential skills. 
Of course, anyone who works the front desk knows about the questions that you get. So mind those. What topics tend to come up? You may find some really interesting uh, niche areas that then explode in popularity and reveal aspects of your collection and programming that you just haven't explored yet. And uh, ultimately, in education terminology, we talk about scaffolding, which is the concept of taking learners uh, step by step through building skills that separate very simple tasks from complex or advanced ones. So as you're creating a program or wanting to do a task, think about what kinds of skills a person needs in order to be able to accomplish the task that you're demonstrating. You may actually find that uh, you're creating an entire series. Uh, for example, we've had several programs that would showcase finished products of experienced costumers and cosplayers, but you're not going to be able to make a full-size Hulkbuster cosplay, which was one of the most popular <laughs> uh, virtual programs that we had, uh, during a 30-minute window or even a couple of hours. So our cosplay construction programs taught smaller skills with a range of tools and abilities uh, that could then be translated into any fandom from designing a pattern, basic sewing skills, aging or uh, crafting that faux metal, making the horns and tails and armor and more. Next slide, please. And as you're looking at your virtual programming, it, there is a bit of a shift from what we look at in our planning for in-person programs. Often when we're developing those in-person events, we build in space to allow for individualized instruction as well as socialization opportunities. But in virtual programming, we have to draw all of that out again. An hour long hands-on event could be distilled into anywhere from five to 20 minutes. And, uh, possibly even broken into a series of programs. There's a temptation to put your best content at the very end of your program to encourage people to keep watching. But one thing that we did find was that a lot of people uh, do drop out uh, during the program. And so we would probably recommend keeping your videos uh, short, keep them very condensed as far as content, front load, all of your essential content and then just build on to it almost like you're creating a newspaper format. Uh, I found myself looking at the format of clickbait quite a bit more as I was going into program design and trying to learn what I could from that and translate it over and putting in those types of hooks that just keep drawing people in. As much as possible, try and remove any of those spacers. Uh, um, uh, so and I never realized how much I used these words until I started listening to my programs and realizing how much I wanted to edit them. But the more you can pull them out and get rid of that dead space, the faster your program will go and the more likely it is that people will be able to continue through the majority of the program with you. And as library staff, we generally like things that are free and that make our job easier. Sometimes when you're building a program, it gets intimidating to have all of the time be on you. And so putting in other video and photos not only takes some of that pressure off, but it also creates a more interesting end product for your viewers. There are some great resources out there for copyright free video and photos, including Pixabay, Pexels, and Canva. And the YouTube audio library is a fantastic resource. They let you search by genre, uh, length, style, and more. And finally, plan for your premiere. How does your, tech, uh, your customer base interact with technology and what types do they use? How are they already engaging with the library? And how can you utilize things to reach all different abilities and demographics? Since some of our videos and clips didn't allow for lip reading, if you couldn't see a person's face, captions were especially important. So we uploaded programs into YouTube to, so that we could get those captioning uh, features and then transferred them into the playlist via uh, Vimeo for LibraryCon itself. Now, after we did that, we discovered that generally the captions appear at the bottom of the screen, uh, which meant that for those of us that had filmed with the main portion of our content, 
uh, right at the bottom center of the screen, we had to adjust how we were filming uh, those videos in order to allow for both the captioning and the content of the video itself. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one of the other features that we included were escape rooms. And an escape experience in its simplest terms is find a lock, solve a puzzle, get the key, unlock, and repeat. And just keep on doing that until uh, you've solved the experience or you get completely frustrated and leave. We had three different library created escape room experiences for different audiences. One was a basic matching game. One had a series of riddles uh, featuring a popular story time character. And the third was a Wonder Woman themed escape adventure for adults and families with two possible endings. Now today's material packets include a number of different resources for creating your own escape room adventure, along with a list of some great virtual ex uh, escape experiences that you can try when you're trying to uh, find the best way and what works for you. Now, I found that the design process of it itself uh, really did take the most time as far as planning and knowing what was going to happen before I tried to get it into the platform itself. The story that you create includes both the theme ways that uh, players can modify their experience and how you will set the experience expectations for their experience. Do you have time limits? Are, is there a firm countdown? How will you keep your players engaged and motivated? And once you have that design, you need to find a platform that will allow you to do specific things like control or share access to the escape room, embed content, uh, provide distinct results for correct and incorrect responses and be appropriate and easy to use for your audience. It's critical finally to do beta testing to make sure that the experience you want for your customers is the one that they walk away with. Keep in mind that the more uh, alternate options you have, uh, the more complex your escape experience is going to be to create. So keep your choice points at a minimum and generally, if the game is gonna split into different paths, try and load it near the end. And that way you don't find yourself creating two entirely separate games. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, there are a lot of great resources out there. Authors and content creators are a huge source of partnership for libraries and archives. Take a look at who's in your region. I dove into lists of who were local Arizona authors, who had appeared at other Arizona events. And ultimately I found out that some of the people were interacting with me from across the country. So it didn't matter as much that I'd started local. I'm branching out a bit more and now, but it does help to give you a starting ground and a fresh footing. Take a look also at uh, arc lists, release dates, working with publishers and promoters to see what's coming out because they have a vested interest in getting you good content so that they can promote and sell their material as well. Secondly, community groups are a great resource. Those same forums that I was a part of that talked about how frustrated they were and sad that they couldn't experience an in-person con, I went back to them and said, hey, is there anyone who'd be interested in doing a presentation with us, uh, doing a video, uh, promoting it to your friends? And so having that conversation really was a great resource. Uh, if you're looking for partnering with a uh, comic book stores or other places where you can do giveaways if you're allowed to ask for donations that can be a great opportunity for you as well and I have to do a bit of a shout out for celebritymerch.com if you're allowed to ask for things these, this organization does handle the fan mail and signed photographs for a number of different celebrities so you can get signed autographs or autographed photos of a-list celebrities that have been on a lot of big name movies, including the Marvel Universe. And ultimately, just ask everybody. You never know who's going to say yes. And uh, when I first started with this, I reached out to people that I knew. And then I asked who they knew. And I ended up working with some really amazing people that I never would have connected with otherwise. And to tell you some more about the different programs and the amazing features you can do, we're going to pass it off to Glenn. Hello, everyone. My name is Glenn, as Shelly did. So thanks for all that information, Shelly. It's super great. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the kind of the nitty gritty details, specifics of some of the, the programs that I did personally. So these are all going to be 
pre-recorded programs. So this is me in that picture over there. That could be its own entire day long presentation on how to make that. But let's go into my first slide here. Okay, so pre-recorded programs. So these are programs you film ahead of time and then you edit them and then you publish them on whatever platform you're using. So for us, we used Vimeo. Uh, eventually we've switched to YouTube because YouTube generates the captions, which we found very useful. So that was uh, one of the biggest benefits of that. And then uh, each of these has kind of uh, statistics, analytics of videos that you can go through. So looking at those kind of can help you point to some trends on what you're thinking of. So as Shelly touched on, uh, shorter videos tend to work a little bit better. Most people do see this kind of arc. Um, it starts off at the top and then it slowly goes down. So the sh shorter you can make the video, the more hopefully you can catch that arc in that start because a lot of people don't necessarily make it to the end. But interpreting video analytics on these platforms could probably be its own entire webinar because they can be complicated and very widely from platform to platform, even though it's the same content at the same time. So those are a little bit of a kind of a mixed bag. So don't put too much stock into those, but you know, just kind of use them as guidelines. Now the types of programs I personally did, um, two or three main ones, I did cosplay programs. So making costumes from scratch. So I called these my cosplay crafting series to help kind of clue people into what exactly that would do. And then uh, like book talks, but I focused mostly on manga and I tried to pair that with uh, some various Japanese cultures. So like making manga and okonomiyaki in one program. So talking about a couple of different manga that are hot and then going into making this Japanese savory pancake to kind of give it some something different, a little bit of flair, a little bit more education and cultural value to it. Now there is a number of benefits to making a pre-recorded program as opposed to a live program or uh, an in-person program. So one of the big benefits is that it's it's very streamlined. So something that would I would run in a two hour program, I can put together in a 20 minute video for people to watch. So that really cuts down a lot of that fat in the program that you normally have. Another big benefit is that you can have as many takes as you want. So if you're working on something and you mess it up, you can just scratch all that and start over again, or you can scratch a very specific part of it and redo that part. Now, this can be seen as a little bit of a mixed blessing because you can kind of get a little obsessive about this and trying to make it perfect. So definitely a word of caution on that. Uh, sometimes you can get a little bit too into making it try to look as good as possible and sort of miss the forest for the trees there. Now, the other great benefit of this is that you can add information later. So let's say you are filming, um, you get it pretty much finished. And then you realize, oh my gosh, I didn't talk about this great virtual resource or digital resource that the library has that I meant to. You can do a couple of different things to add that in there. You can just go ahead and record yourself talking about that and then stick that snippet in there somewhere that would make sense. Or you can add captions to your video saying like, hey, I would recommend checking out this and put up the information there. Now there's a few challenges to pre-recorded programs as well. And the biggest ones for me are these two. There's no interaction or questions with pre-recorded programs. So uh, if you're doing an in-person program, you know, you're working on a project, let's say you're making a, a faux leather bracer, right? Your patrons or customers would ask you like, hey, I don't understand why we're doing this or why do we do it this way or what color would be best here or what's the best process? You don't get that in a, in a pre-recorded program because there's no one there to ask those sorts of questions. So one of the ways I combated this was to have a couple of my colleagues in the room while I was recording, um, tried to have at least two, one that would be very familiar with what I'm doing, a fellow con goer, and then one that would have generally no idea or very little idea of what I'm doing. That way I could try to kind of get a, a spectrum on that. And then I would ask them to, or at least in between segments, because I always film in just chunks because it makes it easier to, let me know if they have questions. And so they would, um, every once in a while, they'd be like, hey, why did you do that? Or is that the best way to do that? Or things like that. So they, they could ask those questions. And then when I started filming the next segment, I could be like, so I forgot to mention, or it looks like um, some people might have a question on this and then bring up that point 
and be able to cover that. Because if they have a question about it, hopefully someone who's in the audience watching would as well. And then the other big challenge for pre-recorded programs is that you cannot easily provide supplies. So theoretically, I could have a packet that people could come to Litchfield Park Branch and pick up and then watch my video and do it. But that would only be relevant to people within driving distance of Litchfield Park Library, which may not be everyone or may not be anyone. I've, I had um, a number of people who watched my programs from out in Queen Creek, and there's no real way that they would want to drive all the way out to Litchfield Park to do this. So while that's feasible, it's not feasible for everyone, which makes it a bit of a challenge. So I tried to combat that by making mine as simple as possible, um, just kind of always using just the bare basics for what you could do um, and trying to give options for things that you could use otherwise. So like if you're cutting foam, sure, a box cutter works great, but if you don't have that, a sharp pair of scissors can work and hopefully you have those laying around. So go ahead, let's go ahead and go to my next slide. So this is just kind of a, a variety of some of the programs that I did. So trying to keep my programs in the cosplay world to things that are are simple, that are self-contained, that are widely applicable to a, a variety of fandoms or groups, and then things that you could do safely at home. So uh, in costuming and cosplay, we kind of have a tendency to um, work with dangerous things and not necessarily always take the best care of ourselves, which isn't the best thing. But so I tried to focus on you know safety, security, and things that you don't need crazy abstract tools for. So things like an airbrush, like not very many people are going to have that unless you're very dedicated to this craft. And in that case, you might not necessarily be watching this, you're probably elsewhere. So trying to keep it kind of focused on that. And now let's go to my next slide. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the other aspect of this that I managed, which was the virtual gaming. So we had two different components to this, which was the Nintendo Switch, as well as computer gaming. So next slide. So for this, uh, we had a few things that sort of worked and a few things that didn't work as well as we would have liked. So we had a Mario Kart tournament that we ran during one weekend for Library Con. Um, it ran the whole weekend. People who had the code that we posted on our website could join this, participate in our tournament, post their high score on it, and then yada, yada, yada. And then we also had an Oregon Trail uh, game sort of submission. So you could go play the Oregon Trail, try to beat it and submit your high score in an email to an email we had set up for this. And then we would have a prize award drawing for just participation for this. So we didn't have great participation on the Oregon Trail. Maybe people have forgotten what the Oregon Trail is now. I hope not. It's a great game. Um, you've died of dysentery, yada, yada, yada. A whole lot of fun. Unfortunately, not a ton of engagement with that. We did have a couple people, maybe less than 10 or so, participate in our Mario Kart tournament, maybe over a little bit over a dozen. And that's okay. Um, there's there's some challenges to both of these. Um, the main challenge to the Switch is that you have to have one, a Nintendo Switch, which is like a $300 investment. And then two, an active online subscription for that, which also costs money. So there's two big money barriers to that one. And then to all of this, there was the big barrier of, it's very hard to have active engagement with any of these that we chose because they just sort of come play, submit, and then leave. And there's really no social thing about that. There's really no way to kind of check to see how you're doing to compare yourself to other people actively, which the gamers really love to do because they're trying to compete in these things. So the next time that I would do this, I would have um, our gaming events and programs be much more live stream focused. So we'd have things like come watch us play. Um, so we would play like, so myself and another librarian, we would pair together and we would play Mario Kart. And this is something we've been experimenting with and having pretty good success. And then we'd have that Mario Kart uh, tournament code out there for people to come join us and then play with us. And then we can chat with them, we can talk and they can type in the chat box on YouTube and actually have a real amount of engagement with that. Um, we could also focus on some more accessible games like the Jackbox party games. These are fantastic because the only thing that your participants would need to play this would be some sort of device that can connect to the internet, a phone, a tablet, a computer, pretty much anything. You just need to be able to open a web browser. Now on the library end, you will need to own the games and have a computer that can run it, but that's really not terribly intensive. 
So that's most of the gaming, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Andrea. All right. Thank you, Glenn. So on to guests. We featured a number of guests during LibraryCon online, including local authors Tom Levine and Kevin Hearn, comic book artist Ryan Wynn, cosplayers from the Super Ladies Foundation, and organizations such as Cactus Brick Builders Club. Next slide, please. When adding guests to our lineup, our programmers, services team, and communications team researched the type of guests we wanted to include. So you can do this through social media, through personal organizations or websites, or by speaking with coworkers and people in your circle about folks that they know, as Shelly and Jolene mentioned earlier. Um, ultimately, you're trying to find folks that uh, would take an interest in participating in a con like this because their invested interest is going to make for great content later on. We also communicated uh, program expectations. We conducted outreach via phone and email to connect with potential guests, again, to gauge that interest in participating. And then for our program expectations, we did go over purpose of the program, potential time commitment, type of interaction, content, uh, the guests would provide and any equipment that would be needed. So how the program would be executed and what technology they would need. This planning slide is also really useful when creating interview content or any content featuring a panel with guest speakers, excuse me. I use these same steps to research more about the guests I was interviewing, set up and confirm uh, interviews via outreach, uh, email and communicating all program logistics to the interviewee. These logistics included interview questions I had prepared, links to the interview platform, a general outline of the interview, as well as any, as any follow-up communication about LibraryCon. I also specified any equipment that would be needed. For instance, all the um, interactions I had, we just used a basic laptop and webcams. And next slide, please. So here are some screenshots I took from my interview with Ryan Wynn. Below you can see some of the comic books Ryan had worked on. The majority of my programming for LibraryCon consisted of interviews and story times. So I interviewed Ryan about his experiences as a comic artist, and I interviewed the Super Ladies Foundation about cosplay. Ryan's interview was about 30 minutes long, and the Super Ladies was about an hour. Um, this time frame is definitely different than some of the other content we had talked about because of the nature of um, um, these segments. So if you're interested in doing a shorter interview or panel series, then breaking the videos down by sets of questions is definitely an option. Um, I just essentially kept the camera rolling because our tone was very conversational um, for this content. And then I also worked with the Super Ladies Foundation on creating story times featuring some very special superhero guests. Story times were between three and five minutes and features the characters reading a story that they had selected. Next slide, please. So interviews can be nerve wracking, especially if you're not prepared for them, right? Whether it's a job interview or you happen to meet someone that you idolize or you're just having a basic conversation and creating small talk. So I repeated the process I mentioned earlier to help me better plan for interviews with my guest speakers. So research, outreach, communication and equipment. I wanted to make sure I was knowledgeable enough about the person I was interviewing so I could ask them pertinent questions um, that had a natural flow in conversation. Conversation. I ended up recording my interviews on Zoom and editing them so I could share them with Jolene uh, to host on Vimeo later. And that was primarily because we were doing some teleworking things and I wasn't um, at the branch working. So it's really important for me to connect with anyone I'm interviewing. Um, especially prior to actually recording your interview. So we scheduled time about 10 minutes prior to recording. Um, so way we could chat about the interview, kind of just get a feel for the other person, make a little bit of small talk before the program. I also reiterated any um, programming expectations and just really wanted to ensure that the guest I was interviewing understood that I valued their time. I wanted to make sure that um, both of us were, were benefiting from the experience. Uh, so as you can see here, I broke, my down, broke down my interview into four parts. First, providing an introduction for your guests. Who are they? What do they do? Why are they here? 
Second, formulate questions based on the information you found during your planning and research. For Ryan, I asked how he got his start as a comic artist, and I also asked him to describe different roles he had with DC Comics. Um, you also have the opportunity to ask follow-up questions if um, your interviewee provides an answer that really sparks something for you. It's always okay to say, hey, I know this wasn't a part of our um, pre-discussed questions, but can I ask you about X, Y, and Z? And sometimes that takes um, your interview into really great directions with even more value content. And then third, wrap up uh, your info with final thoughts. So um, sometimes a recap of the interview and who you've just interviewed is really nice. And thank you is always appreciated. Thanking the guests that um, is with you for sharing their time and their talent and expertise. And then promoting your guest's website or works in your collection is also a great way to connect customers to those resources. For Ryan, I actually went and looked at a lot of um, the comics that we had in our own collection. So that way I could showcase those um, in our video slides. And then finally, Share, share, share your contents. So share that interview link with your guests so they can promote it. Share it with your library's website or social media page if you're on social. Pretty much anywhere that you promote your programs and your resources, make sure you're sharing that content so others are able to find it and have access to it. Next slide, please. So here are some screenshots from my interview with the Super Ladies Foundation. For this interview, it helped to designate an order for the guests. Um, so that way they would know who would be speaking when, and there was little overlap or guesswork about who would respond to questions. Um, I'm interviewing three of their cosplayers here, whereas with Ryan, it was just a one-on-one -on -one interview. And there were two main topics we talked about uh, during this particular interview. The first consisted of general cosplay questions. For instance, tell us about yourself and how you got involved in cosplay. Um, what does it feel like to cosplay a character and how much work and preparation goes into creating your pieces? And then the second topic related more to cosplay and empowerment. So we really wanted to create a dialogue about cosplay and how it's impacted communities and what it means to do cosplay for a cause, C-A-U-S-E, um, by participating in charitable events. So we discussed how their foundation is passionate about inspiring children and young women specifically, and why representation matters. Um, we spoke about the non-competitive environment in their organization and how cosplay has changed over the years. This led to a great dialogue about cosplay is not consent, which was a movement in 2018 that worked to dismantle harassment and offensive behavior toward cosplayers at other events. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a screenshot from our story times featuring Wonder Woman and Black Widow. These story times were really short, as I mentioned, five minutes or less. I provided a general introduction about the story time and closed out the video with a thank you. The cosplayers introduced themselves in character and uh, read the title and author of the book or the illustrator. Um, that they'd be reading. So our guests also showed um, the pictures so viewers uh, could follow along while they read. Um, really a lot of uh, the same techniques we use in story times um, to showcase those books and make sure everyone's able to see and participate. Um, and then our guests um, really kept our story time simple. So uh, they were simple, straightforward, and fun, and were a great way to feature a familiar character reading, right? So having woman uh, read If You Give a Mouse a Brownie, or having Black Widow read five-minute uh, Marvel stories, just being able to have characters um, show that process and, and connect with those kids is a great way to inspire a love of and an interest of reading. And again, as Shelly mentioned, Wonder Woman was the mascot for Library Card Sign Up Month uh, last year. So that was kind of an extra boon to be able to say, hey, Wonder Woman is at our library, um, albeit virtually. So make sure you pick up your library card. Next slide. So resources. If you're not sure where to start with finding potential guests, here are a couple of organizations you can reach out to. I've had a lot of luck, luck with the 501 First Legion, which is Star Wars, 
Arizona Avengers, Marvel Superheroes, Super Ladies Foundation for Marvel and DC. They also do hospital visits. Storybook Entertainment does an assortment of characters, including princesses, pirates, and more. And then you can always check out your commu local community theaters to see if they have any shows that correspond with your library programs. A couple of libraries libraries in town um, have brought in Mary Poppins and Ariel for story time uh, while they were running performances of Mary Poppins and the Little Mermaid. So it's a great cross promotional opportunity um, to increase um, interest in not just literacy, but also the performing arts. And then um, honestly, that can be done with really any popular show that your local theater is showcasing. If it's something pop culture related and you know your patrons are interested, reach out to your local community theaters because they're going to be interested in talking to you too. And then I highly recommend volunteering or attending Phoenix Fan Fusion or any of the cons that we have in state or out of state if you're able. Um, it's a great way to make connections with different vendors and organizations that specialize in all things con. Plus, it's just outright fun to attend those kinds of things. And of course, you can reach out to your local comic book stores to see if they have any connections to industry professionals who might be interested in participating. And then before we wrap up, Free Comic Book Day is coming up this weekend, August 14th, and many of our local comic book stores are offering free and discounted materials to celebrate, so check it out if you're able. Next slide, please. And we've come to the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for listening. I believe we have time for some questions. Thank you so much. That was um, so inspiring. And we do have a couple questions. Let's see if we can uh, fit, fit them in before we run out of time here. Um, what were the stats for LibCon online versus in person? And do you think that, that ages 12 to 17 are growing tired of online uh, uh, programming? So I can tackle the second part of that, but in terms of stats for our online versus in-person, we haven't had an in-person uh, con convention for a number of years. So, and also just comparing stats for in-person to online conventions would be kind of a challenge anyway, because what would you compare website views, watching hours, things like that. So I think that would be a little bit challenging. I don't know if, um, if anyone has anything to say on that for anyone who was around for when MCLD was doing their library con. I know uh, Southeast Regional was one of the largest branches in our system, and they were the ones that hosted LibraryCon in person. Uh, their events would bring in several hundred individuals over uh, a day, but that's a period from about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning until about four o'clock in the afternoon on one day. So as Glenn said, it is a little bit of apples and oranges uh, for a correlation. For our part, we could take a look at things and say, uh, we've had a thousand plays for 18 programs. If we were to offer each of those programs in person individually, we would not have that ex expectation for a thousand participants uh, through the door. Of how much of that is the branding, the fact that we were over a two week period and that since it was virtual, people could access it from anywhere and schedules and driving distance or even the ability to drive were not an issue. And then for that second part, do I think teens 12 to 17 roughly are getting tired of virtual programs? I actually don't think they are in the slightest because they live their entire lives digitally. They did before, they will again after this. You just have to keep in mind that they tend to consume their media very differently than we often present. So most teenagers can probably spend their entire day sitting and staring at TikTok, just watching short little one, two minute videos endlessly. I, I've, I've watched this happen with some teen volunteers in the library. They'll just sit there and just watch TikToks as the hours go by. So um, perhaps not necessarily tired of virtual programs as a whole or virtualness as a whole, but rather um, perhaps we should change the way we think about how we present programs, which so little program bites. Um, perhaps you could think about making a, a TikTok-esque video of your program, condense your 20-minute program into one minute and if they want to watch more, you can say, here's the link to the rest of it. That's a great point. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of uh, 
uh, there's changes going on in the way we consume uh, online information. Um, Matthew also had a great question. Matthew, we'll follow up with you after the presentation because he asked about uh, online streaming versus Twitch um, and sort of those choices. So we'll get back to you on that um, after the program today. Don't forget to complete your brief survey and you will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar and a participation cer certificate. Again, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending today and we will see you soon.